Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. You know, I have a soft spot for underdogs. And if there ever was one, it's the young man pictured here. His name is Howard Taylor. He served in Company C of the 12th New Hampshire Infantry. He really wanted to be a soldier, but he was really small, short of stature, and the chances of him getting into any regiment in the Union Army seemed pretty slim. But he was determined. He really wanted to get in. And thanks to the historian of the 12th New Hampshire Infantry, who was a wonderful writer, Aza Bartlett, tells some great anecdotes. It is one of the best regimental histories, in my opinion. There's a couple stories about our little corporal, as he was affectionately known, and gives you a sense of who he was as a person, his determination to be in the army to fight for the Union, and stories about what happened to him as a result of his war experience and his family. So rather than give it to you in my words, I'm going to give it to you in the words of that regimental historian so you can get a real sense of the moment and bring him to life just for a few minutes here. So here's that first story, which talks about how he was able to get into the regiment. So here we go. Howard Taylor, the little corporal of Company C, had, from the first news from Sumter, that's Fort Sumter, the bombardment, felt an irrepressible desire to enlist. And so when the company was raised from among his neighbors and acquaintances, notwithstanding his youth and smallness of stature, he was bound not only to enlist, but to go so far and fast, at least as his short legs would carry him. Having boldly written his name on the enlisting paper and taken the oath of allegiance, the next thing was to pass examination and muster. Happily, Dr. Fowler was examining surgeon, and upon him he soon found he could rely, not only for safe passports under his hand, but for aid and assistance in running safely past the second and greater danger, the final inspection of the mustering officer. To do this successfully, a pair of shoes was made for him, big enough to admit of extra inner soles, an inch or more in thickness, which, with height of heels and thickness of taps outside to correspond, was sufficient to stilt him up two or three inches beyond his natural perpendicular. Thus toed and heeled, with pant legs long enough to cover, he walked resolutely up the company front from his place on the extreme left, faced and saluted like a West Point cadet, and passed unchallenged into the service of his country. His record there, as seen by a sketch of his life, was second to none, and reminds us of one of the lines attributed to Dr. Watts. If I could reach from pole to pole and grasp creation in my span, still I'd be measured by my soul. The mind's the standard of the man. So that's the first story. Second story is a sketch of his life and military services. So let me get into this for you. Of all the youthful heroes of the 12th Regiment, and their list is effulgent with glory, no one, everything considered, has a better right to stand at the head than he whose boyish but intelligent face many will gaze upon with deep interest. Certain it is that of no other member of the regiment can such an honorable and patriotic family record be written, leaving his own to speak for itself. The title of the little corporal, given him by common consent from the first, being mustered in as such, was most befittingly bestowed, for he was two or three inches shorter than any other soldier of the regiment, and soon proved himself worthy of Napoleonic honors. He was the son of Jonathan M. Taylor, who was a remarkably active and intelligent man for his years, now over 80, and is the father of eight children, by half as many wives, being married four times. 
He has been in the mercantile business in Boston and New York for over 60 years. His third wife, Harriet A., daughter of Oliver Gregg of Boston, was married April 12, 1812, and became the mother of Howard in the city of New York, April 7th, 1845. His two brothers died young, and an only sister, Harriet A. Bond, lives in Detroit, Michigan. His half-brother, Henry M. Taylor, serving through the war in the 3rd Wisconsin Cavalry, rising from private to captain and being in over 20 battles. Howard's great-grandmother was the heroine of Mary Butler's Ride and a cousin of General Butler's father. Her father was a cousin to Mary Eastman, the mother of Daniel Webster. So we've got some early American roots for the little corporal. His great-grandfather, Ebenezer Eastman of Gilmanton, commanded a company of Minutemen in Stark's New Hampshire Regiment at the Battle of Bunker Hill. So there's your Revolutionary War soldier. His great-grandfather, Jonathan Taylor, had two sons, John and Jonathan, in the Revolution, both whom were at West Point at the time of Arnold's treachery, and the gun of John, who was on guard, was found to contain a sand cartridge. Their father, grand, great-grandfather of the subject of this sketch, was kept at home for a while by the wants of his young family. But when volunteers were called for to beat back the enemy, he joined the Green Mountain Boys and fought at Bennington. So it will be seen that one of Howard's great-grandfathers was with Stark at Bunker Hill and the other with Stark at Bennington. Chase Taylor, a brother of Jonathan, was a captain under General St. Clair at Ticonderoga and was severely wounded at Bennington, recommanded the regiment in which his brother and two of his sons, William and Chase Jr., fought. His other son, Nathan, who was at that time lieutenant in Captain Whitcomb's company of independent rangers and who was sent out with 12 men to reconnoiter the day before the battle, was ambushed by a party of 60 to 100 Indians, Three of his men were wounded. Lieutenant Taylor was shot through the shoulder, but saved himself by concealment in the top of a hemlock tree that had been felled a short time before. Thus did the great-grandfather of this little corporal, his two brothers, sons, and three nephews fight, and two of them shed their blood for our independence at Bennington. So I want to pause here. That sounds like a lot of family history, but it gives you a sense of how important it was for the author of this history to connect the little corporal to colonial times and to the Revolutionary War. This is important stuff. It wasn't all that long ago. You think about it, 80 or 90 years before the Civil War is the Revolution. So Howard's great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather are all part of that. So now we get to Howard, the little corporal. In every march and fight of the regiment, except following of the rebel retreat from Gettysburg, where he was wounded in the index finger of his right hand. And that's what we're looking at right here. That's that portrait. But the hospital had no charms for one of his blood. And so instead of waiting for a discharge that he might have had, he ran away and rejoined the regiment at Point Lookout being absent only about seven weeks. Wounded also slightly in the left hand at Chancellorsville and by a mini ball in the head at Bermuda 100, this last wound, though he did not allow it to unfit him for duty, but a day or two at the time, was the cause of his insanity in death more than 25 years afterward. He died, by the way, in August of 1890 only 45 years old. No words of eulogy, though never more deserving, can add anything to a record like this. So there you have it. The story of the little corporal, Howard Taylor, wounded three times in the war, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Bermuda 100, a little guy two or three inches shorter than the average soldier in the regiment had to add insoles to his brogans to be able to join the regiment and get in the army in the first place, gave his all in so many battles with the 12th New Hampshire Infantry. And so it was said, died after some sort of fit of insanity in 1890 at the still relatively young age of 45. So there you have it. 
We'll see you next time on the trail.